So today I'm talking to Julian Huppert, who is uh, Lib Dem PPC for Cambridge. Hi, Julian. Hi. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for sparing your time today. Not at all. It's good to have a chance to chat. Yeah. Um, th the first thing I wanted to ask you is um, just a little bit about about your background. So when did you first join the party, and what attracted you to it? Uh, well, I have to say, I, I joined the party when I was 17, I think it was. Um, I was certainly still at school. Um, and I guess I'd always been interested to some extent in politics. Um, I was interested in the United Nations and human rights to start with. Um, and I found following politics from a sort of lay person's level, I just found I kept agreeing with the Lib Dems. Uh, and so when, when the guy who's now leader of Cambridge City Council delivered a leaflet through my door, um, I thought I ought to sign up. Right. OK. Um, so... Were there any particular policies that um, that kind of stand out in your memory that made you think, yes, I really want to get involved it, with that? No, it, it wasn't. It was interesting. It wasn't about specific policies. It was about uh, the whole ethos, the whole set of values. Um, and what I found, I was initially just watching debates between um, different parliamentarians, and I just found I kept agreeing with the Lib Dem. So it wasn't about this policy or that policy. It was that I discovered that I was a liberal. Uh, that I was a Democrat, that I actually shared those core values. And uh, what kind of links do you have with Cambridge? Uh, well, uh, very strong ones. I grew up here. So I moved to Cambridge when I was three months old. Um, and I've been at school here, went to university here. Um, I've essentially lived here my whole life. I, sti I still work and live in the city. Um, so very, very strong links to Cambridge. Right. Um, and... I, I noticed from your your biography on your website that um, you're also quite heavily involved with the pressure group Liberty. Yes. Um, I, I just wondered how that came about and how long you've you've been involved with them and what kind of stuff you've done with them. Uh, well, again, I'd always been impressed, like I suspect many people um, had with Liberty and what they did, and particularly with Shami Chakrabarti, who's been a really fantastic director there. Um, so I joined some number of years ago. Um, and then I saw that they were looking for um, people for the National Council, which really governs Liberty's policies. Uh, I got in touch with them, uh, stood for that election, and was fortunate enough to be elected. Uh, so I now serve on Liberty's National Council, um, advising Shami and the rest of the team, and working with some, some really very, very good people there. Um, one thing I find fascinating is I hadn't realised when I was first elected um, what I could bring, because there are lots of people there who are much more experienced. What's fascinating is that while there are some really top-ranked lawyers there um, who've dealt with many of the great cases uh, to do with civil liberties, I'm the only scientist uh, on the National Council. And that gives me a particular insight, a particular remit where I can help them. Do you think that that's actually reflective of a slightly wider problem in politics and public life and, and lobbying, campaigning generally, that, that scientists aren't perhaps represented as, as much as they should be? Oh, absolutely. Um, Martin Rees, who's the president of the Royal Society, guest edited an issue of the Today programme just before Christmas. Um, and the figure that he came up with was that there were a dozen MPs uh, at the moment who had um, some sort of training in science or engineering. Uh, that's only a dozen out of 646. Uh, that really is extremely low. Um, and we really have to try and do something about that. Yeah. It's going to, I think, get worse because a lot of those are actually standing down at the next election. With your, your scientific background, one of the things that I was interested just to, to talk to you about was um, I noticed um, in, in the, the policies that it lists on your website that you, you're very interested in evidence-based policy. Absolutely. I, I wondered um, how that might relate to the field of um, drugs policy, which is something that I've uh, been interested in for a long yeah. time, um, uh, and, and how you feel about um, looking at the evidence in a slightly more dispassionate way than perhaps happens at the moment and trying to get that evidence involved in policy making relating to drugs? Well, it absolutely means that the, the way to set policy with regard to drugs is firstly to find out how damaging various different chemicals are, um, and then to decide based on that how you classify. And there's still a very important role for values and for policy and for the politics of it, but it should be based on knowing what the facts are. We shouldn't be responding by saying, here is such and such a drug, it's hit the news, let's ban it, you should find out how dangerous it is. We accept risk in all sorts of areas of life. How much risk are we prepared to accept? Well, do you think that that risk is actually assessed rationally at the moment? Because we have oh, at to... At the moment, no. Well, we have, I mean, as an example, we have Professor David Nutt, 
Um, he was fired. He, he was indeed yeah. fired. Um, and, but earlier last year, a few months before he was fired, he, um, he drew some parallels or some contrasts between um, the risks of taking ecstasy and the risks of horse riding. Yeah. Um, and that seemed to cause a lot of um, problems to do with the government and uh, he was accused of being irresponsible. But all he was really trying to do was say, well, look, what are the risks here? And actually, when you look at the, the raw statistical facts, horse riding is more dangerous than taking ecstasy. So how do you think that we can inject um, a more uh, rational uh, way of looking at uh, policy so that instead of, of pandering to the, the Daily Mail headlines, it is actually considered... Um, like I say, it, more, more in the round in that way? Well, I think part of it is to be open and honest about, about the assessments um, and actually also then to have MPs who are prepared to look at some of those. So it's very rare if you look at a debate in the House of Commons that people actually look at the chances of something happening. They talk about worst case scenarios, you know, this could lead to a death. Well, lots of things could lead to a death. Walking along the road could lead to a death. What you need to do is to think about roughly how much impact does this have, and is that more than our risk appetite? So it means he was absolutely right, I think, to compare um, ecstasy to horse riding. Now, that doesn't mean you say ecstasy causes fewer deaths than horse riding, hence horse riding should be banned. That, that's absolutely not what it is, because there's lots of other things. There's, uh, you know, various aspects about horse riding that make a huge difference, being outside, dealing with animals, there's a lot of other factors. But you have to know what the evidence is first. Um, I think MPs need to understand much more about statistics, uh, about the process of evidence, and then they need to listen. David Blunkett, and it seems a shame to hark back to him, uh, was very clear when he, he was Home Secretary, he didn't care about evidence. He simply wasn't interested in a huge amount of the research that was done. He said that at a criminology conference. Um, we need to move away from that. We need to move to a stage where politicians are prepared to say, we will find out the facts before making a decision. Okay. Um your majority, uh, well, your predecessor... I don't, I don't have a majority, okay, yes. no, fine. Your predecessor's majority uh, was 4,339 at the last election, which for a Liberal Democrat is, is a reasonable-sized majority. Um, yeah. I, I wonder if... Um, what kind of sense of responsibility you have? Well, obviously I feel that I would like to do everything I can to, to make sure that we win. Um, I think that's more important than, than the specific size of the majority. There are boundary changes and various other things. Uh, but David has been a fantastic MP for Cambridge, and lots and lots of people say that. Um, so I think actually that will play very well, that David's achievement, hopefully, uh, will lead to people voting for me to say thank you to David. Um, you uh, were uh, part of the, um, uh, one of the people who uh, sponsored the, the motion, the emergency motion, mm. at conference recently on the digital economy bill. Indeed, yes. Uh, you you summarised it, and um, I, I was in the hall. In fact, I, I contributed to the debate as well. Um, yes. And um, I, I just wondered how you feel things have gone since then, because that's now as we're speaking a couple of weeks ago, and it's starting to look like the bill might go through in a not particularly changed form. So I just wondered how, well, how you think that's panned out. I think part of the thing is that all we can actually do is control Lib Dem policy and what Lib Dems are saying. And I think we've made good progress on that. Uh, it's not necessarily been everything that we'd like to see. But ultimately, the system that we have in, in, in this country means that the government can do anything they like. If the government wishes to shove something through the House of Commons, they can. They have the votes for it. That's the way government works in this country, and I think that should change. Um, but if the government chooses to just go ahead, they can get the digital economy bill through. Now, what I really hope is that they won't do that and that they will realise that some sections of it would be a complete disaster. And I know that Lib Dem MPs uh, indeed have already been quite clear about the lack of scrutiny that's happening. David Heath raised this in the House of Commons on the 11th of March, I think it was. Um, and I'm sure that will happen as well when it comes to be debated on the 6th of April. Uh, we can fight the good fight. We can make it clear what concerns we have and why. Uh, you know, we've written an open letter in The Guardian. There's been a, a whole lot of other activity. But ultimately, if Labour and the Conservatives want to push this through, there's very little that we can do. OK. Uh, Julian Huppert, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Great to talk to you. And you. All the best.